Hopefully the last tape you watched was the one on Sigmund Freud. I'd like to talk about one of the people who was a couple generations down, student of his, who's now been named psychologist of the century. And I actually took a, a seminar from this guy. His name is Albert Ellis. And so we're going to talk about therapy today, rational emotive therapy. And he took uh, Freud's ideas to heart. He tried to follow those in his therapy. And what he found was that they just didn't work very well. That they simply didn't work very well. And so this is Albert Ellis, trained in Freudian psychoanalysis. And in response, he developed rational, emotive therapy. So it's R-E-T, rational emotive therapy. Now notice the words rational. What's that mean? Well, it means logical. And then the next word's emotional. Isn't that contradictory? Rational, emotive, or logical emotions? What he's suggesting is that you and I can bring emotions into a logical analysis to some extent. Emotions happen, but what we do about them really is very powerful. Uh, do you remember Schachter's theory of emotion? I'd kind of refer you back to looking at that part of the tape again very early under motivation and emotion section. Schachter showed us that in his two-factor theory of emotion that it wasn't just the biology, the adrenaline that was injected into the people that caused emotions. It wasn't the other factor of what they were told, in other words, how they cognitively labeled the emotions. Remember, one group was lied to, one group was told they were going to uh, feel numb, and the other group was told they were going to feel excited. The group that told, were told they were going to feel excited had cognitively labeled these new feelings OK. And so they didn't change their emotions when they were put in with an angry or a happy person. So that's where this intellectually comes out of. And Albert Ellis uh, is this interesting character. He's got this nasal Bronx accent. When he turns sideways, he's so thin, he's just astounding. He's got this huge honker of a nose. In therapy, he curses, <laughs> he tells jokes, he sings, he's got a horrible voice. And he's just an interesting, interesting guy. And what he found when he worked with his patients using Freudian therapy is that things didn't work very well, that they got worse. They got to be whiners. Remember our critique of Freud? And he said, by goodness, these people need to take responsibility for their behavior and quit blaming everybody else. And so he developed this theory uh, that has the A, B, C, D, and then finally even an E component. And let's go through and, and talk about each one of these. And what I'd like you to do is to be able to come up with real life examples to stick in here. Because this is a therapy you can apply on yourself. You can reframe your thoughts. You can change what you're thinking. You know, it's kind of like uh, based on, on the old Greek philosopher, uh, Epicritus, 2,000 years ago, who said, it's not what happens to people in life it's how they react to what happens to people in life that makes them happy or unhappy. Now, that's a powerful thought. Uh, a similar thought comes out of Sheryl Crow, the singer's got a song out now that says something to the effect of, uh, it's, it's uh, wanting what you have, not having what you want that makes you happy in life. Powerful ideas here coming from various sources. Now, the A is the activating event. In other words, somebody cuts you off in traffic and flips you the bird. That's the activating event. We jump to the emotional consequence. That's the C, the emotional consequence. And we just jump to it. And what he argues is we get somebody flips the bird, and we jump the emotional consequence. We're angry, and we might flip them back off, or we might pull out a gun or we might chase them down and try to you know, get their license plate, or we might try to run them off the road, or any number of what really are fairly strange behaviors are, of course, many people don't do that at all, right? They simply go, well, that's OK. I know a lady who, instead of flipping the bird back, she just waves. And in her mind, she's saying, I'm giving you five fingers. <laughs> but she's smiling, and she's not getting herself in trouble with these other people. She just waves, giving those five fingers the wrong way. But what he says is that we have underlying Irrational, notice that, irrational beliefs. Now, if they're underlying, they're really kind of similar to what Freud's talking about with the unconscious, right? But these are irrational, crazy beliefs, and that's the B. So we've got an activating event, something that triggers the situation. We get angry, we get depressed, we get uh, you know, self-insulting or something of that nature. And we go to our underlying irrational beliefs, and those are things like, 
I must have total control of my environment. I should be treated better than this. He says, you're shouldn't all over yourself when he used the word should. He says, those are keys that say we're believing irrational things. Let me take a look at a couple of these irrational things in just a minute. But, so now we've got the irrational beliefs. So the goal of therapy is to dispute these irrational beliefs for the therapist to help the person find out the irrational beliefs so they can change their thinking. And that's what we call the DIBS sheet, D-I-B-S, and that's disputing irrational beliefs. All right. And then the E is the new emotional consequence. Once I've disputed these irrational beliefs, I come up with a new emotional and behavioral, for that matter, consequence. Okay. Let me give you an example from romance. I assume that most of you have had uh, romances that have worked, and most of you have had romances that have failed, and you've been hurt, and you may have hurt others. If you're of any age at all, you've probably had these experiences. So let's go through that. The activating event is someone breaks up with you and tells you that you're a horrible person. Your emotional consequence is what? Oh, God, this is terrible. I hate that person. I can't stand them. Or I'm just horrible. I'm a loser, and they would have loved me. Or I'm never going to try this again because this person was so horrible to me. Love can't work. Notice all these shoulds, musts, can'ts. Those are the extremes making a mountain out of a molehill. hill according to Ellis. And so he would say, what, what's the irrational belief there? Someone dumps me, they treat me unfairly, the emotional consequences, I'm, I'm upset. Well, that's a normal feeling to be upset or to be depressed or to feel badly, but it's irrational to make these statements, I'll never date again, or I can't stand being around people of the opposite sex, or I must be a real loser if she or he didn't want me. So he works with the client through humor and songs and all kinds of stuff to get them to, to care about and see what their underlying irrational assumptions are. So when he's disputing these irrational assumptions, what might be a way of disputing it? Well, that person didn't like me, and, and maybe there's some points that this person made, but there are other people out there that I can, I can figure out what's wrong and I can find somebody else. I was, I, had, uh, I was fine when I was by myself before I met this person. That's a rational statement. So you dispute the irrational behaviors by saying it's irrational to say I must have that person. There's only one person for me. You dispute that, and then you come up with new emotional consequences and new, exper and new experiences. And that new experience would be saying, you know, you, you dispute it by saying, hey, that, that uh, is an incorrect statement. I don't have to have that person. I can figure out a way to be happy even if I'm alone the rest of my life. Or uh, I'll meet somebody new eventually. I'll give you an example very clearly. A young lady was in my class. She was just devastated about five years ago. Uh, this boyfriend had treated her horribly. She had a baby by him, by the way. Uh, tremendous emotional involvement. And he just walks away and goes away with another woman and just tells her she's too fat and walks off. And it's just devastating to her. And I worked with her for a while and talked to her. And I said, you know, do you really think that you can't live without that person? Yeah, I can't. I'm going to die. Well, we talked about how that was irrational, and time after time, finally, she, she said, you know, I think I can make it. It really hurts. Now, that is rational. It hurts that he called me that name. It hurts that he walked away. It hurts that I'm a single mother, but I can deal with it in some way or another. That's rational. Four years later, I get a letter from this gal, and she says, you know, this was the best thing that ever happened to me. That guy was kind of a schmuck. I met a new guy. He accepted my daughter. We're madly in love. We've been married for for uh, uh, two years at this point, I think it was by that time I talked to her, and he's just a wonderful man. He respects my intelligence and who I am, unlike Bill ever did. So things that look catastrophic really can be looked at from another perspective and eventually probably work out. Now let's take a look at some specific examples here. Uh, if we focus in on this purple sheet here, I don't know if you can see those words or not, but I'll kind of lead you step by step through it. And it's simply a cartoon version of what I've just done. If you look at the first, it's this person who has an activating experience that jumps to an emotional conclusion. And they're happier, they're, I mean, they're, they're angrier, they're depressed. And then the underlying irrational beliefs are things like, I really must be a worthless person if she doesn't like me. Hmm, that's irrational, isn't it? I'll never find another good woman like her. Hmm, 
How can you predict the future? She doesn't want me, therefore no one could possibly want me. When you hear yourself say these things, these are irrational statements. Saying I'm unhappy, is that irrational or rational? That's rational. Um, this is awful. Everything happens to me. Everything happens to you? Probably not. That, that bitch, she shouldn't be that way. Well, number one, he's calling her a name that's not helping anything. She shouldn't have acted like that. Well, she did. Can we deal with it? And then finally, I can't stand the world being so mean and, and uncaring. Well, we can stand it. We've made it through before. We'll make it through again. And then so disputing the irrational beliefs would be something like, where's the evidence that because this woman wishes uh, to end our relationship that I'm a worthless person or that I'll never be able to have a good relationship? Why is it awful that I'm getting, not getting what I want? Why shouldn't the world be fair and full of injustices sometimes? Because that's the way it is. So that's the A, B, C, D. And now jumping to the E here, uh, the emotional consequence or effect. For example, sadness. Well, we did have a nice relationship, and I had lots of good times, and I'm really sorry to lose it, and I feel bad about it. But I'm going to stay out of dating for six months, and I'll think about things, and then I'm going to start looking for someone else because I'm going to go on with my life. So that was the new emotional experience. Now let's look at some of the key words we'll focus over on this sheet uh, that are irrational. These are cues that they're irrational. Uh, how awful versus this is disappointing. It's disappointing. It hurts. That's rational. How awful. I can't stand it. That's irrational. Let's jump down to another one. He has no right to act that way uh, versus he has every right to follow his own mind, though I wish he wouldn't have done it uh, to me. I wish he wouldn't have done it that way. I wish he hadn't done that. Every time I try, I fail. That's irrational, because it's not true. But maybe sometimes, maybe even frequently, things go wrong. Um, this should be easier. College should be a lot easier than this. By God, I should just be able to do college with no problem. Well, he says you shouldn't all love yourself. How about, I wish this was easier, but often things uh, that are good for me aren't easy. No gain with that pain. It's tough, but I'm learning. Those are, are rational and irrational sorts of statements. If you look at Ellis's theory, he has 10 irrational ideas that underlie all these problems. And he basically says that virtually everything that goes wrong on the basis of just everyday problems can be summed up in these 10 irrational ideas. And I'll just look at a couple of them, and you can kind of look up more on the internet, perhaps. Um, I must have love or approval from all the people I find significant. You know, it would be nice if your mom was a wonderful, loving mom, and for most of you, maybe that was the case. For some of you, that wasn't the case. But are you going to let that ruin your life because your mom was an alcoholic or had problems or maybe mistreated you as a child? Are you going to mentally masturbate and go through your first five years and go into therapy like Woody Allen for 27 years? Or are you going to take hold of where you're at now? Change your life, set goals, and achieve them and create a good future. Another irrational belief. Um, my past remains all important because something once strongly influenced my life, such as parents, neighbors, even sexual abuse, uh, that it has to keep determining my feelings and behavior today. Let go of the past work with it as much as necessary, and then move on. Don't be the high school hero who's still whining about, my god, I, I was a star in high school football, and I got myself hurt, and I can't do anything now, and I'm 34 years old, and uh, I didn't go on. Uh, and then finally, let's just pick another one out here. Um, emotional misery comes from outside pressures, and I have little ability to control or change my feelings. Have you ever heard us say, you made me mad? Yeah, we do it all the time. What's that say? We're like puppets, marionettes that are being controlled by other people. Really, we might have an initial emotion, but then we can say, well, that person might be having a bad day. That's why they're treating me unfairly. Maybe they really are having a rough time or hate what's going on in their life or just had an argument with their wife, and it has nothing to do with me. Uh, my wife is always in, in reminding me in the car, and she's like Miss Pollyanna sometimes. <laughs> so I tease her about that. You know, I'll get irked at somebody who's driving like a fool, and she'll go, you don't know if they have a pregnant wife in there who's trying to get to the hospital. You don't know if somebody just had a heart attack or if they just had a great fight and they're just pissed off. It's not about you. <laughs> and that would be a rational statement. And my wife is a therapist, by the way, so ah, thank God. She helps me out. <laughs> okay. So Albert Ellis disagrees with Freud on some key issues after being trained in Freudian analysis, 
And I want to leave you with one statement that came from Epicritus that I started this all off with a few minutes ago. And that is, it's not what's going to happen to you that's bad in life that's going to make you unhappy. It's your choices and your reactions to what happens to you in life that's going to determine whether you're happy or not. You can have a leg amputated tomorrow and still have a happy life.